I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today we continue with Section 10.2, The Russian Cosmists, The Esoteric Futurism of Nikolai Fedorov and His Followers, by George M. Young. We're picking up at the beginning of Chapter 2, Forerunners of Russian Cosmism. The seminal thinker, whom Berdayev considered the most Russian of Russian thinkers, and from whom the Cosmist movement took its major themes and directions, was Nikolai Fedorovich Fedorov, 1829-1903, pronounced and sometimes transliterated Fyodorov. An eccentric, abstemious, 19th-century Moscow librarian, who published only a few anonymous newspaper pieces in his lifetime, but whose writings, posthumously edited and published by disciples, have been derided as crazed fantasies by some and hailed by others as literally the philosophical equivalent of the second coming of Christ. Since we shall shortly devote separate chapters of this study to, of Fedorov's life and thought, we shall not discuss details of his project here, but in order to gain a fuller sense of what we do and do not term cosmist, we shall turn instead to brief sketches of a few other Russian thinkers who explored the territory between science and magic before and during the time of Fedorov. Vasily Nazarovich Karazin, 1773-1842 One of the major divisions in humanity that Fedorov wished to heal even wider and more destructive, he believed, than the division between rich and poor, was the division between the learned elite, who had the knowledge but not the will to act, and the unlearned masses, who had the will to act but not the knowledge. Nevertheless, several times in his writings he presents as a model for the rare person with both the knowledge and will to act. Vasily Karazin, a Russian-Ukrainian intellectual prodigy, who published important works on agriculture, pharmacology, chemistry, meteorology, and physics, and in 1802, at the age of 29, founded the University of Kharkov. Of him, Fedorov wrote, We shall speak of Karazin, the many-sided man, as a meteorurgist, not as a meteorologist. The difference between the meteorology and meteorurgy might be defined as follows. The former has as its ultimate goal the forecasting of famine, whereas the latter has the goal, and in that the and initial goal only, of salvation from famine. Evidently fearing that his words could be mistaken for an endorsement of an esotericism which he either did not recognize, or to which he could not admit his intellectual debt, Fedorov immediately assures us that his use of the suffix urgy is entirely benign. Unfortunately, the word urgy has been degraded by mystics and has acquired from them a connotation of wizardry, secret, irrational activity, influence of a blind force of the soul, and not an open, transparent, joint activity of reason upon the blind forces of nature. The specific activity of reason for which Fedorov praised Karazin was his establishment in 1810 of the first weather station in Ukraine. And in 1814, while experimenting with the use of weather balloons to conduct electrical currents as part of a procedure in the production of saltpeter, he wrote to Alexander the First's advisor, Arakshev, outlining the enormous potential of electrical power for both military and peaceful purposes. Fedorov quotes from Karazin's letter. If the experiment, as I hope, definitely confirms my hypothesis about bringing electricity down from the upper levels of the atmosphere then man will obtain a new implement which he has not previously possessed. Water, air, fire, animal power, gravity, and the expansion of certain bodies are until now the forces by the control of which we operate machines. Consider, Your Excellency, what new results will follow if we control the mass of electrical power extending through the atmosphere, if we will be in a position to distribute it according to our will, and man attains the ability to manage atmospheric conditions, to make it rain or shine as he wishes. According to Fedorov, Karazin was the first in Russia to call for the systematic, rational, human management of nature. 
The complete proposal that Karazin eventually put before the Tsar was for experimentation on a large scale involving not only balloons but great explosive projectiles with the ultimate goal of maximum human control over all meteorological phenomena. Although the emphasis in all his meteorological proposals was on the potential benefit of, to humanity, implicit was the potential for military use and the warning that if the Russians did not develop this technology now, some enemy would surely do so in the future. Karazin's proposal was referred to and eventually rejected by a commission headed by the Ackerman academician Nikolai Fuss, a mathematician and designer of scientific instruments who, perhaps not coincidentally, also advised the editorial rejection of the first book written by the future non-Euclidean geometer Nikolai Lobachevsky, later generally recognized as the foremost mathematician in Russian history. The Fuss Commission found that while the potential benefit of electrical power was well known, Karazian's proposals were based on unproven hypotheses and impractical procedures and therefore should not be awarded the relatively modest amount of financial support requested. Fedorov's complaint is that minds like Fuss's dominate the world of the learned, in the world as it is, but that truly learned men like Karazin, who propose projects to benefit the unlearned, represent hope for the world as it ought to be. Karazin then represents one important feature of cosmic thought. The insistence that present sciences of observation and discovery become sciences of action, transformation, and creation, that every discipline now as ology become an urgy. Alexander Nikolaevich Redishev, 1749-1802 Karazin, so far as we know, said nothing about active evolution. But another forerunner of the Cosmos movement did. Alexander Radashev was hailed from the middle of the 19th century through the Soviet period, primarily for his role as a radical social critic and political thinker. He was arrested, tortured, and exiled under Catherine the Great for having depicted the brutish conditions under which most Russians lived in his 1790 classic, Journey from St. Petersburg to Moscow. But in addition to presenting indisputable evidence of the drastic need for social change, Radishev, in a 1792 work on man, his moral mortality and immortality, presents a literary preview of the idea that man is an unfinished, evolving creature. While arguing his major point, that man is endowed with an immortal soul that lives beyond the death and disintegration of the mortal body, he writes, But can man really be the crown of creation? Can these wondrous, splendid, gradual increments, having led up to him, break off, cease, and come to nothing? Impossible. Redeshev further explores various hypotheses of what happens to, be to us after death of the body, but he does not offer detailed suggestions concerning what might lie beyond our current stage of evolution. So while Karazin offers, at least in Fedorov's representation of him, a precosmist example of ology becoming urgy, Redeshev offers a flash preview of the idea that humanity is an ongoing process of evolution. Two poets, Mikhail Vasilyevich Lomonosov, 1711-1765, and Gavriya Romanovich Derzhavin, 1743-1816. Two other important 18th century figures of genius, Mikhail Lomonosov, a poet and pioneer in many scientific fields who, in Pushkin's apt phrase, not only founded, but was himself our first university, and Gavrila Derzhavin, ranked by the death, ranked by the dean of Russian literary historians, Prince Dias Mirsky, as one of the supreme poets in the language, also prefigured some cosmic tendencies, but did not develop them fully. In his astronomical poems, Evening Meditation on the Divine Majesty of the Occasion of the Great Northern Lights, and morning meditation on the greatness of God, Lomonosov uses sonorous, majestic, skillfully rhymed verse to present accurate, original, scientific observations about the northern lights and firestorms on the sun. The son of a peasant fisherman from the far north, Lomonosov was a passionate, prodigious early learner who ran away from home as a teenager to study in Moscow and, taking up one subject after another, 
mastered everything he put his mind to. As a many-sided genius from a humble village who wrote advanced science in verse and who directed his readers', readers attention to the wonders of the cosmos, Lomonosov clearly shared personal biographical traits and intellectual inclinations with the later cosmists. But his spiritual outlook was more deistic than thaumaturgical, more contemplative than active, and his unification of art and science was closer to that of a poetic astronomer than of a visionary astrologist. In his poems, the wonders of the universe are already wonderful enough. We don't need to improve on them, as Fedorov and some of the later cosmists will suggest we should. Similarly, Derzavin is more of a great man of his age, comfortable with himself in his time, resigned to his own mortality, rather than a restless visionary whose ideas and hopes must wait for future ages. His poem God is the majestic celebration of the deistic universe, and of the inner spark of the divine that joins each person to the absolute, the part to the whole. Especially famous are the lions. I am the link to worlds existing everywhere. I am the very last stage of matter. I am the focal point of everything living, and the starting point of the divine. Though into dust my body will disintegrate, my mind will command the thunder. I am czar, I am slave, I am worm, I am god. Throughout the rest of the poem, however, and in the worldview expressed in Derjavin's other philosophical poems, the emphasis is always on Almighty God's power at work through our feeble transitory frames, rather than a cosmist emphasis on the new, creative, godlike people we can become and the new universe we can create with our godlike powers. Prince Vladimir Fedorovich Odovsky, 1803-1869 A writer, philosopher, musicologist, and philanthropist who was closer to Fedorov and the Cosmos in time and spirit is Prince Vladimir Odovsky. For some years he was with Pushkin, co-editor of The Contemporary, the leading thick journal of the early 19th century, and was the host and driving force behind the Lovers of Wisdom, a semi-secret society of prominent young th thinkers and men of letters, including both future Slavophiles and Westernizers, who gathered regularly until the 1825 Decemberist uprising and the resulting crackdown to discuss the works of Schelling, Bohm, Tieck, Goethe, Byron, and other Western writers of idealistic, romantic, or mystical orientation. In his later years, he directed major libraries, first in St. Petersburg and then in Moscow at the Rumiantsev Museum, where Fedorov would work in the last decades of the century. Odovsky's own stories and novellas earned him the nickname the Russian Hoffman for their esoteric and macabre subjects. But his major literary work, and the one that established him as a forerunner of the cosmos, is an unfinished epistolary novel, a remarkable futuristic fantasy, the year 4338. The world by that year is divided between the two great powers, Russia and China. Bankrupt Britain has sold itself at auction. America is little more than a shell for individual speculators and isolated exploitative capitalists. And the rest of the world belongs to one or the other of the two great powers. Pneumatic air travel, sky hotels, controlled weather, electric illumination for homes and covered gardens, magnetic baths that induce candid confessions and repel hostile vibrations, Magnetic communication devices, plastics, even something like blogs are all common in Russia, the center of world culture and advanced technology in 4338. Due to a natural law of accelerated time sense, the citizens of that world know less about ours, 2,500 years before them, than we know about the ancient civilizations, 2,500 years before ours. Almost nothing from our time has survived into theirs. The few negative relics of our basic human nature that remain include insecurity, vanity, flirtation, and procrastination. More serious flaws such as selfishness, poverty, ignorance, competition, war, and tragedy are all things of the past. Life is comfortable, interesting, cooperative, and good, better in Russia than in China or anywhere else. The only problem is that within a year a giant comet is expected to destroy the planet. The letters describing Russian life during the year before the comet is predicted to strike and are written by a visiting student from China to a fellow student back home to Beijing. In a further narrative framing device, a Russian man in the year 1839 has perfected self-mesmerism to the degree that he can choose to project his consciousness to enter any 
mind at any point in time, past or present. Russian astronomers of 1839 have predicted that the great comet collision of 4339, so out of curiosity to learn just how far humankind will have advanced before the world ends, our self-mesmerizing Russian time traveler projects his consciousness into the mind of the visiting Chinese student. Odovsky's projected novel is in part a futuristic variation on the last day's theme made internationally popular at the time by Karl Bryulov's celebrated 1830-1834 painting, The Last Days of Pompeii, and by the esotericist Lord Edward bulwer Lytton's enormously popular novel of the same title, published in 1834. Odovsky died before he could finish his work, so we do not know whether he intended to have the world be destroyed by the comet or saved by science. The visiting Chinese student reports that the leading Russian scientists are confident that new technological devices they are developing will save the planet, but ordinary citizens fear that the world is doomed. Literary historian Victor Terras suggests that Odevsky implies that the world will be destroyed because the Russians of 4338 have forgotten God and have put all their faith in science. This would put Odevsky in the Slavophile camp in the long debate over whether Russia's future should follow the path of Orthodox spirituality or Western science. Svetlana Semenova, however, suggests that the year 4338 is more utopian than dystopian, and the visiting students' raptures over the wonders of advanced technology outweigh the anxieties of the ordinary citizens. She also points out, however, that in another work, The Final Suicide, Odovsky does clearly warn that technology alone unguided by religion can only lead us to self-destruction. The solution which Odovsky proposes in his essay, Russian Knights or the Need for a New Science and New Art, lie in a new comprehensive worldview that combines science, art, and religious faith, a position that Fedorov and the Cosmos will build upon. Alexander Vasilyevich Sukovo Kobylin. Apologies if I'm butchering these Russian names. 1817 to 1903. Another precursor of cosmism is the acerbic dramatist and almost misanthropic playwright and thinker Alexander Sukavo Kobylin, a fabulously wealthy aristocrat who was accused and arrested, but later acquitted of the murder of his French mistress. Sukavo Kobylin was at the center of a notorious protracted scandalizing court case that embittered him for life, but inspired the dramas that constitute his literary legacy. Kuczynski's Wedding, The Case, and the Death of Terelkin, a savage cosmic comic trilogy that still plays to appreciative audiences in Russia. It was his enormous wealth, Sukavo Kabylin argued, that drew the false accusations against him, and only the bribes that his wealth enabled him to pay secured his acquittal. His dramatic trilogy w vigorously satirizes the greed, corruption, and bureaucratic stupidity that have long plagued Russia among other places. After his ordeal, he withdrew entirely from his previously active roles in Russianized society and devoted himself to translating and explicating Hegel, advocating vegetarianism in the abst abstemious life and in surviving fragments of an original philosophic manuscript destroyed by fiver, fire, he developed his own eccentric but visionary version of spiritual Darwinism. The negative side of his thought focuses on the law of selection which he interprets as God's wise and unflinching wrathful judgment, allowing the strong and rational to flourish and the weak and foolish to destroy themselves. It is obvious, he writes, that by means of this wrathful judgment of divine wisdom, mankind advances in its progress, i.e. approaches the eternal idea of rationality, in that, we, that the weak perish and disappear by the fire of selection, while the strong develop, thrive, and advance. On the positive side of his thought, more consonant with later cosmism, Sukovo Kobylin posits three stages in the development of humanity. Telluric, or earthbound man, confined to the planet we inhabit, solar man, inhabiting our solar system, and sidereal man, inhabiting all worlds throughout the entire universe. Only the third sidereal stage of humanity brings the absolute freedom that is the goal and perfection of all human movement and development. Human evolution operates between two extremes from the lowest herd-like bestial state to the human angels fit to inhabit the infinite city of God, 
from the horde of the mob of savages, from the human herd, begins the sociological series of steps, i.e. the advance of human society, that, it, that advance which is the process of the spiritualization of mankind, and only in infinity does that spiritualization reach its conclusion in the supreme reality of divine reason, i.e. in the kingdom of God, the Civitas Dei. Important steps in the process of turning ourselves from human animals into human a angels include becoming vegetarians, developing lighter and smaller rather than suit more massive bodies, and gradually acquiring the ability to fly. And flight for Sukavo Cup Island does not mean merely the invention of flying machines, but the growth of wings and attainment of the bird-like, insect-like skill of aerial self-propulsion. He writes, The entire theory of humanity and its infinite development, i.e., the philosophy of the history of mankind, is the process of its freedom from spatial constraint, in other words, its passing into spirit. The result of spiritualization or subjectivization is perfection, pointedness, so-called tu chechnos. The hu history of spiritualization is the history of self-propulsion, the autokinesis of mankind. The steam locomotive and the bicycle were, in his time, the most advanced mechanical expressions of the human wish to fly. The bicycle especially represented horizontal flight. But all these contemporary devices are nothing other than the steps taken by humanity along the path of its subjectivization or spiritualization. A person flying horizontally on a bicycle this is already motion toward the form of the angel, the highest human. Through the invention of these machines of horizontal flight, mankind moves closer to an angelic state or towards ideal humanity. Every thinking human being can understand that the bicycle represents precisely those mechanical wings, the starting point or kernel of the future organic wings by means of which humanity will undoubtedly break the fetters confining it to the telluric world, and humanity will escape by means of mechanical inventions into the solar world around it. Humanity in its present telluric stage is too much a captive of gravity in its senses. To develop this ability to fly, we need to develop more lung capacity to reconfigure our body's ratio of air to solid mass. If God is spirit and spirit is spaceless, then man approaching God should consume his spaciousness, i.e. reduce his body, and by this reduction of the body become more and more spiritual, i.e. free himself from the burden and fetters of space. We see this in the animal world in the form of flying insects who, owing precisely to their reduced size, i.e. their proximity to spirit, are wonderfully mobile. A fly in one second flies over approximately 100 times its own length. If a man could attain that same degree of physical freedom which a fly has attained, he would move with great speed 100 times his length, race almost 200 meters in one second, i.e. move through the space with the velocity of a cannonball. To approach a state of absolute freedom, perfection or divinity then, mankind must reduce the size and weight of the human body and negate space and extension. Extension constitutes the spatial fetters of man's spirit, which from birth set the boundaries of his movements, i.e., Initially, in the savage state, keep him tied to the place he inhabits. Given the many millions of stars that recently had become visible through telescopes of, at this time, and given the astronomical evidence that the laws and natural processes apparent on Earth are also apparent elsewhere in the universe, Sukavo Kobailan, writing, at a time when the universe still seemed a single unified field, reasons that our planet cannot be the only one that is habited or habitable. In one word, if a sphere or planet whose chemical composition of matter is identical with the composition of other planets finds itself under the same forces, then there the planet's processes will also be identical, and their origins and development will be the same. In a word, reason is one and matter is one, and therefore their products will be identical. But in order to inhabit the entire universe, we must evolve beyond our present earthbound state. Sukovo Kobylan's unique contribution to pre-cosmic thought is his idea that the further we evolve, the smaller our body should become, and that as we approach divinity, we will also approach a vanishing point of spaceless invisibility. God is invisible, and we shall also become invisible, essentially bodiless, as we approach the goal of perfected, spiritualized, universal humanity. These pre cosmic thinkers, then, project several of the lines that Fedorov, Solyov, Bulgakov, Vernatsky, 
Siolkovsky and others will extend further. Again, I apologize for butchering these Russian names. Radishev's keen social concern and belief that evolution cannot have ended with man in his present state finds ultimate development in cosmos projects to reconstitute and thus save all of humanity. Odyovsky's futuristic vision of an advanced technological world culture led by Russia finds its extensions in the scientific cosmos speculations about control over nature and the reshaping of the universe. Sukovo Kobylan's thoughts about the stages of human evolution and the changes needed in the human body and spirit point towards the cosmos concepts of the noosphere and emergence of the God-man. How the cosmos tendency relates not only to a few pre-cosmos thinkers, but to the entire tradition of Russian philosophical speculation is what we shall now consider. Thus concludes section 10.2 of the Russian Cosmists, The Esoteric Futurism of Nikolai Fedorov and His Followers by George M. Young. Next time we will continue section 10.3 in chapter 3. I will see you then. Alam.